Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. This is a Currents episode. Currents are shorter and less heavily produced than our full-length episodes and generally focus on a single topic. As always, links to books, articles, and organizations mentioned are available on the episode page at jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest is Connor Leahy. He is a machine learning researcher working on advanced general artificial intelligence technology, including unsupervised training, reinforcement learning, scaling, etc. His greatest interests are in research towards AI alignment and strong AI. He is a principal on the Eleuther.ai project, and his day job is at Aleph Alpha, a very interesting company, which we'll talk about a little bit. Welcome back, Connor. And by the way, Connor appeared on episode Currents 033, where we dug deeply into GPT-3 and his project, GPT-NEO, which is a open source quasi-competitor GPT-3. And if you're interested in those topics, certainly check out that episode. Anyway, welcome back, Connor. Oh, thanks so much for having me back. Yeah, it was a great conversation last time. In fact, uh, we, I had originally intended to go further afield, but we just dug in so deeply into uh, the GPT-3 and related GPT-NEO, NEO-X topics that we didn't have time. So I invited you back for a part two where we'll talk more generally and perhaps less structuredly about various AI-related topics In our pregame, you mentioned that you have released a new model of GPT-NEO. Why don't you tell us briefly about that? So it's technically not a GPT-NEO model. It's kind of a side project done by one of our Luther members, Ben Wang, with help from Aaron Kamatsuzaki. Uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, Aaron. It's called GPT-J. The name comes from, because it uses a different code base. It uses a code base based on the new Google framework, JAX, and is trained on TPUs. It is currently probably the best open source natural language model. It is at 6 billion parameters, 6.1 or something. I'm not exactly sure. It was trained on TPUs using a mesh JAX transformers library or whatever, I forgot what it was called, that Ben made. Uh, he did almost all the work himself. So all the credit goes to Ben on this one. He really, cr- crazy guy, smart guy, did a great job. And we trained a 6 billion parameter model with a slightly different architecture to what we do with Neo. So it's more modern. Neo is kind of closer to like old school GPT-2 and 3. J includes some new tweaks and changes to the architecture to make it more efficient. It was also trained for longer. It was trained for 400 billion tokens instead of 300 billions. And with that, it is now pretty much on par with like the uh, second largest GPT-3 model, the GPT-3 Curie model that OpenAI offers. We ran them both through benchmarks and they perform very similarly. Uh, of course, there's some differences. J is very good at code technical things, like medical information. It was trained on a lot of like medical papers, a lot of scientific papers. Very good at that kind of stuff. Very good at code. Um, slightly less good maybe than GP3 at like storytelling and stuff, but still very comparable. Cool. So if people want an open source version, check it out at eluther.ai. As always, the links will be on the episode page at thejimrutshow.com. Well, let's get rolling into the uh, topics uh, we want to talk about today. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Aleph Alpha, your nominal, at least, day job. Uh, You know, I found the name kind of interesting, Aleph Alpha. Aleph is Hebrew and Alpha is Greek. Is there any uh, significance to that that coupling that you know of? I think the, if I remember correctly, the Aleph name just came from the infinity hierarchy. So you have like Aleph zero and Aleph one as like the different cardinalities of infinities. And I'm not sure exactly the significance of Alpha. So I didn't found the company. Um, I was one of the first hires, but I didn't found the company. So I don't remember exactly the whole story of the name. Yeah, it could well be an Aleph, Aleph, which is, as you say, is the lowest order infinity. And then someone might have said, well, shit, let's just translate that into Greek, right? For whatever reason, Aleph is being a Hebrew. It's the name of the first uh, alphabet in the Hebrew alphabet. Anyway, the homepage has some interesting things we can sort of spark a conversation about. It says that you're interested in shaping European research and development for the next generation of generalizable artificial intelligence. And then on the Twitter page for Aleph Alpha, it says that you're working to build a European artificial general intelligence. So 
talk a little bit about what you all are up to there. Yeah, so Aleph Alpha is very much a European company. So we're based in Germany and we were proud of being a German company and being a European company. And so basically the way we kind of see it is, is that like the US market has a very healthy, vibrant AI ecosystem. Like it's no, it's no secret that almost all of the, you know, high tech applications you might use every day are usually American made. The, there's also a pretty large sector in Asia, especially in China, who have like their own like parallel market and such. But it's almost a cliche to mention it is that Europe has kind of fallen behind in this regard is that there are very few like large, you know, really successful tech companies in Europe. And we find this to be a shame. We think Europe is pretty good. Like, you know, there's problems with it. Of course, we have problems with, you know, you know Germany and Europe, but we quite like it here. And we would like to create a better, you know, uh, AI and tech uh, ecosystem here in Europe. It's not always been easy. Raising investments in Europe and in Germany is much harder than, say, in Silicon Valley. But we want to ensure that, you know, also th that the European market also has access to, you know, really good, really high quality AI technologies. In our, in our, like, in our perfect vision, we would want, you know, a great graduate student from Germany could come to like Aleph Alpha and would be as competitive or like as prestigious, you know, maybe as going to like a company in Silicon Valley or something like that. Of course, the advantage of companies like Facebook and Google is that they have obvious uh, monetizable applications for earlier AI. How does uh, Aleph Alpha get around that problem? So Aleph Alpha in the sense kind of is, I would describe it like most closely to, uh, at least in our ambitions to a European open AI but let's say uh, more more upfront about commercial interests in that regard. So yeah, to be clear, you know, the Lutheran Aleph are separate entities, and I try to keep them separate in that regard. But uh, Aleph is a uh, is a for profit company. The goal is to build large generalized models, uh, GPT type models, uh, some other things that we've been working on, and offer them to customers to perform you know, various useful services. We basically are very strong believers and have been for a while now that this kind of technology is just on the cusp of being extremely economically important. And we want to be there. We want to have everything in place. We want to be established when that takeoff really happens, which we think is basically currently happening. So our, our main projects we're working on GPT type ish technology. I don't want to go into too many details about you know, what we're working on behind the doors, but uh, basically, yeah, we want to offer AGI or however you want to call it, like these types of services in Europe also. So we also have like a pretty big focus on multilingual data. We don't want to have just a English models, we want models that can be used hopefully by uh, lots of people all over Europe speaking different languages. And yeah, lo lo lots of projects. It, we're still pretty young. It's still pretty early startup. So we don't really have it any like huge customer facing things, but Stay tuned. Okay. That sounds uh, really, uh, really interesting. Though it does sound like you're taking the language model approach mostly. Is that correct? Or are you looking at other things as well? We are looking at other things, but we there's nothing I can talk about publicly yet that we, later we're ready to show. We're, but yeah, most of all, we're, we're, we're first looking at language modeling. Um, there are other things we're very interested in, but I can't, you know, commit to anything. Yeah, yeah, I will say I, I'm somewhat of a skeptic on how far language models will take us to AGI. We uh, chatted a little bit about this last time. Maybe we can go into it a little bit more. And then, as I dug a little further, I, I found a paper that you wrote for the Aleph Alpha site. I believe you wrote it called "Multimodality: Attention is all you need is all we needed." which was actually somewhat closer to my own thoughts on the issue. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what your thinking was there. So this is a pretty common uh, discussion I have very often. And, you know, uh, opinions shift pretty quickly as new information uh, gets out. But basically, I think it's kind of a null hypothesis that multi-model will work for like, maybe like not AGI, let's say like transformative AI. It's like, I think like better word, because that's like more defined by how much economic value these things can produce. I think it's pretty obvious that you know, humans, you have eyes and ears and you know, skin for touch or whatever, and that's enough to train a pretty powerful intelligence system. So I think it's like a null hypothesis to say that you know, with enough image data and or video data and et cetera data, we should be able to train something that is as intelligent as a human. I think there is the other hypothesis that maybe language is enough in like a non-trivial way. I consider this to be a hypothesis that I think is more plausible than people give it credit for in my opinion. So I, I'm not saying that I'm sure this is true. I'm just saying 
the more I deal with these like language models and the more I see like these scalings and such, the more I see like, hey, there might be, it, it might actually be possible, but that's a hypothesis. Now, interestingly, your subtitle is attention is all you need. And yet when I read the essay, there wasn't a hell of a lot in it about attention. What did you mean when you put the word attention in the subtitle? Because attention, by the way, is one of my pet things in the work I do in uh, kind of at the intersection of cognitive science and AI. Uh, so that was basically kind of a cheeky meme the original paper introducing Transformers is called Attention is All You Need. So it's kind of like a, <laughs> almost a, um, uh, is a common thing to riff on that for titles. And basically one of the core things that I found, like in the early days of Transformers, when people talked about, oh, you need multimodality, you need, you need video or whatever, and people would say, look, Transformers, they only work for text. But kind of the, the, when I said attention is all you need, is all we needed. What I mean by that is we've now know we have stuff like vision transformers and like a hundred different variants of, you know, different like audio and spatial and whatever transformers is that these same architectures can pretty easily be generalized to other modalities. So whether or not text is enough, it seems like pretty plausible that attention slash transformers might be still enough or the right architecture or a good architecture. Let me say it that way for solving these kinds of problems. Across multiple modalities, such as yes. video and image. All right, well, that's good, uh, good clarification. Now, I think we both agree that we're getting pretty close to where you know, general AI technologies will become economically useful. In fact, I, being the former king of internet domains, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I registered a fair number of domains, proto-AGI, you know, which I think is an interesting concept, which we're not actually beyond human capability across the board and highly generalized, but the shit is uh, good enough to be, you know, pretty valuable, pretty powerful, and, you know, maybe dangerous, right? So let's uh, turn to another one of your topics, which is AI risk. Uh, in fact, you recently retweeted something from Eliezer Yudkowsky, who I've chatted with several times. Never on the show, though, so uh, one of these days I'll have to have him on. After many years, I think the real core of the argument for AGI risk, AGI ruin in parens, is appreciating the power of intelligence enough to realize that getting superhuman intelligence wrong on the first try will kill you on that first try, not let you learn and try again. But let's use that as an introduction to your thoughts about AI risk. So AI risk is a very interesting topic is that people react to it from my experience in kind of like one of two ways. Either you introduce it to someone and they're just immediately, oh yeah, obviously. <laughs> like how, how could it be any other way? That's like the most obvious thing in the world. Why are you even telling me this? And the other half of people get really irate and are like, what are you talking about? This is all nonsense. This is da, 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 da. It makes no sense. You're, you know, and then you know, a bunch of like straw men arguments about what I believe or don't believe. This is a bit of a straw man. Of course, I, I, I appreciate the irony there. But yeah, it seems pretty obvious to you. So like, there's lots of very, very good, very comprehensive write-ups, you know, justifying why AI risk might make sense. But uh, like a very simple intuition is just intelligence, in my definition, is kind of the ability to solve problems. It's the ability to take actions to achieve goals. And it's pretty obvious to me that if we create systems that are capable, very, very, very capable of solving problems, of achieving goals, if we even very slightly misspecify what we want these things to do, there's no, no limit to what these, I mean, there is limits, of course, physical limits, but like these things may be capable of doing extremely complex, extremely powerful actions in order to achieve those goals. We already see this with, you know, comparatively very simple systems, like, you know, with like uh, economic regulation or something, you want companies to not do X, but they find some loophole in the tax code that allows them to do that. And suddenly everyone is, you know, doing something uh, that we don't want them to do. Or another example is, uh, this comes from a guy on Twitter, Rocco, who describes the food maximizer. He describes in like the 19th century, we summoned a weak super intelligence that he calls the food optimizer in order to feed all of the humans. And it's gotten so good at that, that like 60% of the Western world is overweight or something at this point, that we have a goal. We, you know, we, we incentivize the system to produce food, food that we want to eat, but we don't incentivize the system necessarily to give us food that is healthy for us to eat. So instead the system figured out that giving us food that tastes really, really good, but it's not good for us, is a really efficient way for it to, you know, maximize profit. So even though we created the system in order to help us, and it did, you know, it gave us lots of food, 
it also produced lots of very non-nutritious food or very you know sugary food because that's a way you know to hack human motivation. And so it, it seems to me pretty obvious that if we create systems that are even far more intelligent than that, it's very hard to know what these systems might be capable of and predicting what they will do ahead of time. Yeah, I think uh, that's a very nice example. I like that, the one about the food system, because that actually is closer to my own near-term concerns, which is, you know, the famous paperclip maximizer where uh, somebody accidentally uh, programs the first AGI to optimize a paperclip factory and it takes over the world, kills all the people and turns the whole earth into piles of paperclips. Yeah, maybe that's plausible. Maybe it's not. I've I argued with Eliezer about that to some degree. But I think some of the risks in the near term are more of the sort you just described. For instance, I love to point out that human evolution is now, in the West at least, substantially under the control of our dating apps and the AIs behind them, right? You know, things like uh, Tinder and OkCupid. I don't know. I've been happily married for 40 years. So I don't know about this shit for terms of actual use, but talking to Kids today, goddammit, uh, it seems like a large percentage of them are using these apps to meet people, which will eventually lead to marriages and reproduction. So human reproduction is now being substantially channeled by whatever the AIs are that suggest people to each other. And uh, the implications of that, you know, hard to say. Will it increase autism? It might. Uh, will increase sociopathy? It might. You know, the real players may be really good at gaming the algorithms better than they would be gaming the bar scene. And lots of sociopathic uh, genes might enter the gene pool with uh, all all kinds of results. So that's that's kind of interesting, you know, where much lower power AIs, which we hardly even recognize as AIs, can have tremendous impact potentially on human trajectory. And the other one we talk about a fair bit uh, on the show and elsewhere is, you know, the uh, machine learning algorithms, things like Facebook and YouTube, which by figuring out, uh, optimizing on an economic model, how to make you the subject to as many ads as possible, basically, tune the content that you see with probably fairly substantial impact on our information ecosystem. So I'll just throw those out for you to react to. Yeah, absolutely. Those are real considerations. So here's like one of my favorite examples. A good friend of mine, uh, Stella Biederman, always brings up this example, is that uh, Google Maps a while ago changed a little bit how they do their recommendation algorithm. And what it caused is, is that it suddenly routed a lot of traffic through this quiet neighborhood in LA which was previously like off a highway. And because they tweaked the algorithm, the algorithm said, oh, the highway is really full of traffic, take this alternative route. And this caused this whole little neighborhood to suddenly have a very large amount of traffic. And there's a very obvious question is like, this was obviously not intended by Google or something. They didn't decide to do this, but this was a real harm caused to real people. And is there some kind of liability here? How could you predict things like this? I think there are many, many examples of how even like very primitive, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider, you know, Google Maps to be an AGI, obviously. You know, it's a, it's a pretty simple algorithm, all things considered. But even these pretty simple algorithms, like the Tinder dating app, you know, algorithms, whatever, all pretty simple. Even these are already basically unaligned. They're out of control. We don't necessarily know what they do, and we don't necessarily know how to control them. So let's say we find out that, I don't know, like a, you know, a recommender app on YouTube does something we don't want to do. Often we can't know that until it happens, and often... We have to like, you know, just kind of like guess how to fix that. It's not obvious necessarily how to how to patch such an algorithm. It's not like there's necessarily code, especially if it's a, if it's a machine learning model. We just have this big black box of a bunch of numbers. And somehow we're supposed to patch that to, to you know, fix a certain problem. So to bring this back to AGI alignment. So I'm saying we can't even get these teeny little, you know, super, super subhuman algorithms to do what we want them to do. Why do we think we'll be able to control human or superhuman algorithms? That seems kind of arrogant to me. Yeah. And the problem gets smarter if you assume that the uh, AGIs become strategic agents, which they may or may not. And I think this is maybe my center of my question about the the strong form of the AI uh, risk argument. Is is it necessary that AGIs have agency? I'm not sure that they, they have to. Not necessarily, but it turns out, so like this is something that like some of my friends work on and that I'm also very interested in, is that defining the concept of agency is really, really hard. And often it like pops up in like situations where you would like, not expect it to pop up. A classic example is an essay by Gwern, Why Two Will AIs Want to Be Agent AIs? And he explains that like, 
assume we had like an Oracle AI. The only thing it does is answer questions, right? You just type in a question and it outputs an answer. That doesn't seem like it would be an agent, right? It doesn't seem like this thing could destroy the world. And, you know, maybe that is safer, but there's also a story you can tell about how such an agent could still be very dangerous. For example, if the agent is incentivized to give correct answers, so you give it like reward when the answers are correct and you give it like negative reward when the answers aren't correct. Well, maybe the agent will then strategically start giving you answers that will change your behavior to make the world easier to predict. Like maybe it finds out, oh, if I if I advise these people to start nuclear war and they do it, then it's really easy to predict what's going to happen next. Everything's just going to be dead. That's really easy. So there's all these like really weird edge cases you can get into. And of course, that world is already here to some degree. Google search is clearly biased these days, right? There's lots and lots of studies that show that it's got political biases. It tries to rule out certain concepts through its auto-suggestion. It emphasizes certain search pathways. So Google search, you know, part of it by machine learning, but also probably part of it by human policy is already a, a biased oracle for presumably, well, who knows anymore since Google gave up its meta law of don't be evil. So who knows what its motivations are? And that sort of gets me to the next step in AGI risk is, you know, while the paperclip maximizer or the oracle that convinces us to start a nuclear war is certainly possible, I think there's going to be earlier risks around bad people with powerful proto AGIs. You know, imagine something, and you allude to this in where we're going to go next with is your counting consciousness series. That at some point, whether it's GPT three and its errors and assigns or other technologies, it seems very likely that producing better than human quality text, probably videos, at some point etc purely by machine will be possible and you know what happens when say a china you know as one obvious example or you know uh, some master manipulator billionaire in the west decides to essentially uh, massive attack on the information sphere on the meme space of humanity with computer generated content which is amazingly good you know imagine you know netflix movies which are more engaging more powerful more seductive than anything ever done before and i can imagine that and yet those are not agi technologies really because they're special purpose they're not they don't have transfer learning etc let's talk about that one call it bad guys with proto agi so that's absolutely a threat vector and that is one that a lot of people take very seriously I personally like to kind of push back a little bit against that narrative. I think it is absolutely a threat vector. This is a way that harm can and will and is being done. Modern defect technology is very, very good. I think people still don't understand, like, if you have, like, just, like, 10 machine learning engineers uh, and, you know, a refrigerator full of Red Bull, they can make some really good defects nowadays. And I think this is something that a lot of people have not yet reckoned with, like, just how quickly these things are going. And in a sense, this is kind of like a zen of the crux of the argument here is that uh, you earlier mentioned a tweet from Eliezer that I retweeted. And Eliezer is one of the few people who kind of thinks this is not the biggest threat vector. And I actually agree with him on this. I really, really want to explain why I think this. I think what you describe only will happen if superhuman AGI doesn't happen very soon. Basically, I expect the way I look at AI technology, it's accelerating so fast. Technology is going ahead so quickly that by the time quote unquote bad guys have like figured out how to use this technology at scale, there's already so much more powerful technology they can use that it's just not gonna matter. So what Eliezer was talking about is, is that if AI technology happens fast enough, if there's, you know, we don't have like a long, you know, time of like, you know, things going wrong, us fixing it, you know, something else going wrong, fixing it. But if we have technology that is so powerful, they can just irreversibly, you know, destroy or harm or, or control everything in one go, then our current systems are based on error-based learning, you know? It's like currently deep fakes don't get regulated until, you know, some politician gets deep faked and then suddenly it gets regulated. Like that's usually how these things go. And it's just a very common human thing. And that works fine if you have like ergodic assumptions, if you can try again. But the fear that I have, uh, I, I'm very concerned about like long-term future X risk type situations. It's like, don't get me wrong, all these things are real risks. Real people are and will be harmed by these technologies, by bad actors. But in a way, it feels parochial if you compare it to the threat of, you know, all humans going extinct or something like that. And if these very powerful technologies emerge soon, 
and we don't have enough an understanding of how to build them or use them safely, and we don't have the time to experiment with them without things going horribly wrong, I think we're in deep shit, really, really deep shit. In the sense that maybe these deep fakes are, you know, cause some harm here, and maybe GP3, you know, propaganda messes over up over here. But then if a metaphorical paperclip maximizer emerges and paperclips everybody, well, <laughs> you know. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I agree with that. Two key assumptions there. Let's dig into them. One is that AGI could happen soon, right? Now, we've probably both seen the various polls of leading experts, and uh, they're all over the place from people who believe it'll happen tomorrow afternoon to people who it'll never happen or 300 years out. I think the last poll I saw, the median of AI experts was 40 to 50 years to AGI. On the other hand, there's a substantial bubble, including some people I know and respect a lot who say five years. And it matters a lot on this, where's the risk? You know, bad guys with strong proto-AGI is much stronger than GPT-3. Again, you take my thought piece of uh, a, a suite of technologies that could, that could create de novo, a Netflix 10-episode series that was way more compelling than any ever created before and was larded with all kinds of intentional but hardly detectable propaganda, as an example. You know, su- such a thing would be extraordinarily dangerous in, in many ways that we probably don't even fully anticipate. And if AGI is 40 years or 100 years out, we're going to have to confront those risks. On the other hand, if my friends that believe AGI is five years away, then probably we don't. The the paperclip maximizer is the risk we need to be optimizing on. So where do you come down on when is the threshold crossed of AGI? So yeah, I I really like the way you framed that there. I fully agree that if you accept like a hundred year timeline, then yes, you should be worried about these threats more. But my timelines are more on the order of five to 15 years. So I have very short timelines. Just the amount that AI has progressed in the last two years just blows me away. It's unbelievable. And it, it doesn't seem to be slowing down. For the first time in my career as an AI researcher, I feel I see like a direct path to how an AGI could be constructed. Like not that I could like do it myself right now or anything, but like there's no, and here happens magic in the equation. It's like, I see Uh all the parts you need and I see like at least potential solutions to each of those parts. And I don't see anyone where I have to say, uh, magic, put insert magic here. That was not the case like five years ago. Like five years ago, there was many paces where I would say, and insert magic here, because I don't know what to think about it. But for the first time, it seems to me that we're racing towards actual designs that could really become extraordinarily powerful. And I also like to just like make clear again, that like it doesn't really matter if the agent has like general intelligence, you know, can it climb a tree? Doesn't really matter. What, what matters to me is, you know, can it cause irreversible harm. Like how much power can these agents have? And quick tangent here that I think is like important to mention is the concept of instrumental convergence. So th- this is like a pretty important crux of my argument is that there is a pretty, I think, intuitive, there's also more formal versions of this argument. I like Alex Turner has done some good work on this, but basically you can, in many, many scenarios, so for many possible goals, gaining power is a really useful thing to do. And another useful thing is staying alive. So a common example is what people that uh, dismiss AI risk, they say, well, we'll just turn it off. It does something bad. Well, here's a simple thought experiment. Imagine you have a robot, an AGI robot, and you use it to get you coffee. So its only goal is to get coffee, right? So immediately it, you know, bursts through the wall, you know, it runs over your cat, you know, it, it destroys everything in its way to get to the coffee machine as quickly as possible. You're like, no, 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 I don't want you to do that. So you run over to hit the off button on the robot. And what will the robot do? It will stop you because you never gave it a will to survive or consciousness or anything like that. Nothing like that. You just gave it the will to make coffee. And but the thing is, the robot will correctly reason if I'm turned off, I can't bring you coffee. So therefore, it will actively resist you shutting it down because then it won't be able to make you coffee. So even this extremely simple goal of make me coffee can already lead to an agent that will resist being shut off. And for like more complex or powerful goals, I, that's the instrumental uh, convergence hypothesis. These goals of not wanting to be shut off and also of like gaining power, whatever power means, you know, it might be economic power, social power, or you know, computation power. Those are just very useful things that we should expect most agents with most goals to by default, unless we somehow stop them from doing this, 
by default to pursue such dangerous objectives. Mm, that's an interesting example. Though, of course, uh, a stopper would be something as simple in that particular scenario as Asimov's ancient three laws of robotics, right? Which says never harm a human takes precedence over any mission that you're given, right? So if we could agree to cook in something that, well, I don't know when he wrote that, like 1950, you know, when this is before AI was even really dreamed of, there could be some fairly simple prescriptions against those kinds of situations. Uh, probably not, no. Because like, let me put it this way, how would you turn that into code? Like, how would you turn those three laws into actual code run by an actual agent? Trust me, people have tried. It's not easy. And you get into like all these repair paradoxes. Like, so no action that could cause a human to cause harm. Well, any action could cause a human to, co to come to harm. So any agent with that law would just immediately shut itself down because any action it takes might cause human harm. So, okay, now you have to have put in some kind of realization. Now you have to give it like some kind of uncertainty prior. Yeah, some Bayesian calculator probably. Y right? Yeah, but then you get into the problem which prior do you use? You know, how conservative or not conservative, what counts as a human is, you know, if someone is brain dead, are they still a human? If you have a simulation on a computer, is that a human? You know, again, it's tough. Interesting. Yeah. Then this is, this is why I'm, I'm glad that, you know, people like Miri exist who, and like you who are, you know, working this, right? Because uh, this is not a superficial question. This is definitely not a superficial question. Now let's go on to the second part of the risk profile. And this is how quick would the takeoff be? I mean, if we go back to the original statement way back yonder on the techno singularity, the concept is very simple. And I, it used to be fun to tell random people this because they'd never heard it and they'd freak out. <laughs> now the, the idea has, has kind of gotten out into the world and most people who pay attention have heard about it. The idea was, all right, once we get an AGI up to like 1.1, the horsepower of a human, we give it the task of designing its successor, right? And its successor is 1.3. And then its successor is 1.7. Then its successor is 2.9. And then its successor is 9.6. And then it's 1,000. And then it's a million. And then it's a billion, right? And that's the takeoff rate problem. And it's an interesting question. Uh, I actually uh, participated in a Actually, I was a, sort of an instigator just sitting there watching but asking pointed questions when Eliezer and Robin Hansen debated the takeoff question once before Miri back when it was uh, singularity.org in their group house down in San Jose. It was really a kind of a fun conversation. And anyway, I'll just give your thought to the takeoff question, then I'll give you my own thoughts on it. I find it's difficult to think about these kinds of questions. So like two categories that people like to talk about nowadays is like the uh, Eliezer style fast takeoff is what people call it, where you go from like zero to, uh, you know, 100 billion trillion in like a very, very short amount of time. There's like no warning almost. It just happens very, very suddenly. So like the most extreme example is to kind of like, you know, someone lets their network run overnight and the next day suddenly it's God, <laughs> you know, kind of like situation. Of course, something that extreme is silly. I, I don't expect things to go that fast. So an alternative, which is kind of interesting, is kind of like, it's kind of generally attributed to Paul Cristiano is this concept of a slow takeoff. But ironically, the slow takeoff feels faster than the fast takeoff. <laughs> um, well, could you unpack that one for me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me unpack that for you. So in a fast takeoff, you kind of have like a flat line, just zero, 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 and then zoop, and then it goes like really high. While a slow takeoff is more like a hyperbolic takeoff. Basically, what the, the thesis of the slow takeoff is, is that we're going to have a four-year economic doubling time before we have a one-year economic doubling time. So it would still be extremely fast, and it would feel faster to people because people could see the four-year doubling time and then the one-year doubling time before we hit the singularity. And this is, I think, I think more people nowadays kind of imagine situations like that. Like it seems also nowadays we have like very much have these like multi-stakeholder takeoff type scenarios. We have not just, you know, one AI made in one lab by one person, which is kind of like more of that like old school Eliezer type thinking. Nowadays, it's more like that these, these AI systems will be very complex, very expensive systems that are built by large organizations. And there's lots of complicated thinking about like, what does that mean? What is safer? What is not so safe? You know, what does this mean? And I guess I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a bit ambivalent on this. I try to like, it doesn't matter really exactly how the takeoff goes. What matters is these agents are going to appear very soon. They're going to be very powerful. And if we don't align them, we're fucked. <laughs> That's kind of what I focus on. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, my own take on takeoff is that in principle, fast takeoff is possible. 
uh, because human cognition is so weak. You know, this is an insight I had about six or seven years ago is that to the first order, humans must be approximately the stupidest possible AGI because we are the first to appear in our evolutionary tree. And Ma Nature is seldom profligate in her gifts, right? You know, we get only as much as we're likely to get from random rolls of the dice, essentially. And so unlikely, we're, we're very far over the line. And further, there's some empirical evidence that I think the one that's most obvious, easy to understand is the famous working memory limitation, Miller 7 plus or minus 2, which on later examination looks more like 4 plus or minus 1, which are the elements you can keep in working memory simultaneously. And that has unbelievably huge implications. For instance, our ability to read and write, the nature of our language, are totally gated by the fact that we can only process, as I at most seven things more or less simultaneously, and our syntax only really has an effective range of seven. People who don't know that write scholarly papers, which are impossible to fucking read, right? And the truth is, when we read, we don't actually understand everything in the paper. We create a, a rough gist, essentially, because of the fact that our working memory size is seven. You know, the description of it at the time was, you know, Einstein was a nine, the village idiots a five, basically. And that's probably not far uh, from wrong. But what is a, a hundred, right? A working memory size of a hundred that you could actually fully understand and fully parse language or code, probably more importantly, code in blocks of a hundred is so far beyond human capability that uh, it's really, I literally can't vision what that might be like subjectively. And, you know, when you say a hundred, what about a thousand? What about a million, right? What about a billion? What about the ability to read Wikipedia and have it all in your head with full total random access to be able to see all the self-referential links and all that sort of thing? Not to even mention some of the other weak shit in our cognition. For instance, our memories, you know, our episodic memories are just also very rough and ready. They decay over time. And even worse, every time we access a memory, a random amount of noise is added to the memory. So our memories suck. Right. So imagine something with a working memory size. Oh, that's cap you know, a thousand with total high fidelity memory, et cetera. That's going to be a fuckload smarter than we are. Yeah, I fully agree. Like I can understand people that say, oh, maybe AI is going to like take longer. Maybe we're going to like run to robots. But people who say it's impossible it makes no sense to me. Like as you just described, even these like very minor changes to just a human level agent would already make it so much vastly more powerful than a human that, you know, who, who knows what the limit is there? It seems very obvious to me. Yeah, I would agree that sometime superhuman intelligence, I would be shocked if it doesn't happen. However, there's an interesting trend that I think does maybe move us away from the LEs or fast takeoff, which was 10 years ago when I first started following this area, a lot of the thinkers, including Eliezer, and he frankly personally worked on this for a while, thought it was all about some magic algorithm, right? They, that the AGI solution was math, right? Uh, and yet, uh, the work that you're doing, you know, people like OpenAI and Google and Facebook, et cetera, uh, it's turning out that at least this road, which may or may not get us to AGI, is more about data and computation. And adding more, you know, data and computation while their exponentials, you know, they're Moore's law type exponentials, maybe data exponentials a little higher. Well, algorithms could literally, you know, if it turns out that math was the answer to AGI, one could literally write the right algorithm uh, and the thing was, uh, you know, couldn't play checkers in the morning and by the afternoon it was God. But if the issue is more data and more computation and uh, more network capacity, perhaps, which is I'm thinking is important, then the takeoffs by definition almost are going to be slower than if they're algorithmic. Yeah, I agree. That, that's a good way of phrasing it. Like, I think you're correct that the reason a lot of the early people thought differently than we do nowadays is because they thought about algorithms, like AI is algorithms differently. They thought that there was a, a special math. And if you figured out this special math formula, you know, you would get like huge improvements. It's possible that such formulas exist somewhere out in math space or something. But it seems to me that at the moment, at least the way things look, is that it's more that you have kind of like computational reducibility. It's just to get a certain level of intelligence, no matter how clever your algorithm, you still need a lot of compute. <laughs> you still need a lot of data. 
to like locate the right hypothesis in your hypothesis space or whatever. Not saying that our algorithms currently are by any sense like the limit of what might be possible. You know, the thing that I just like always try to remind myself is that the space of all possible programs is one of the weirdest eldritch horror escapes imaginable. It's un <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's unknowable what things exist in the space of all possible programs. So it's best not to, you know, to, to reason about that too much. Yeah, I can't say too much about it. And as someone who's fooled around with genetic programming a fair amount, uh, one realizes just like Borges' library, most of it's total shit. But then it's the search problem in a, in a space of infinite shit. Uh, how do you find the uh, you know the much smaller number of actually interesting things? In fact, I had a really interesting podcast last month with Ken Stanley, who is probably the leading dude in the world in evolutionary AI. And he talked about his book about open-ended search and how thinking non-traditionally and non-objectively may actually be an interesting backdoor to exploring this area of interestingness that's not necessarily goal-related. In fact, he's going to be on tomorrow. We're going to do a deep dive into evolutionary AI, which uh, happens to be one of my personal pet areas of interest. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. So if we look at you know, sort of cross these two things, when and how fast the takeoff will occur, probably you and I share a view that uh, the takeoff won't be overnight because of the fact that at least the roads we're currently on seem to be data and computation. And I would add network interconnect. I think that's the part that's missing, by the way. Yeah. We'll take time and take actual physical resources to build. I'm more agnostic on when, you know, I just don't know. I don't, you know, of course you're closer to it than I am. So, uh, you know, based on uh, that heuristic, maybe uh, you're closer than, you know, I, I will go with the consensus guess 30 or 40 years because, yeah. not because not because I'm an expert, but just because that's the, seems to be the median expert things. But nonetheless, it does mean we have something to worry about, but I would argue it also means we have to prioritize bad guys with proto AGIs, perhaps a bit more than you might say. Maybe. I mean, I, I would like to I'd add to that, that a solution to the alignment problem is also a solution to bad guys with AI. You know, if we had a super nice AI that knows what the right thing is for humans and, you know, robustly can follow that and we build such AIs and we just, you know, you know either destroy or make illegal to build other kinds, that also solves that problem. It's a, it's a, it's a more general solution. And also another thing I'd like to raise is just kind of like... Um, I think I like to say about AI alignment and safety and such is that if you work in this field, you have to be comfortable multiplying really, really big outcomes by really small probabilities. So like that's like a, one of the arguments about Miri, even like in the early days, they always were clear that the chance that you know they're at the right time or they're doing the right thing so early in AI development is pretty small. But the potential outcome that maybe if they get something useful out of it is so large that it can still be worth it. So it's kind of like this risk benefit trade off in that I think working on these short term AI problems gives you a more assured outcome. Like you're more likely to be to do something that will have a net good. But I expect that net good to be uh, the magnitude of the net good to be so much smaller than the possible net good of doing something very risky with long term AI that the at least for me, Personally, you know, of course, you know, all the where these priors come from when you pull them out of your ass at some point um, is that it feels to me that working on these very risky, low probability of working, but extremely high, you know, potential payout things is a very good investment. But, you know, that depends on one's personal, you know, risk tolerance and the like. Yeah, I got I did get ill easier to admit in personal conversation that he thought we were probably fucked, but that there was a small chance we weren't. And therefore, it was still worth all of his effort, everybody's effort, even if it was a 1% chance that we might not be fucked. It was it was worth working on. I agree. And I thought that was. That that would be an interestingly weird place to work for your career, but <laughs> I, I honor him for that. I'm glad he's there. I mean, you think he's a, you know, one of the most important humans that we have, probably, right? Yeah, I must also say I, I uh, do look up to Eliezer a lot. He was a very great inspiration for all the work I've done. His work on the sequences 
probably the number one most influential work on my personal thinking. So I'm also extraordinarily glad that someone like him exists. Yeah, indeed. Uh, now let's move on. Uh, we don't have as much time as I would like on this, but when I was doing my research for our original podcast, I st- and we didn't get to talk about it at all in the first episode, Connor has written this very interesting, somewhat peculiar series of essays called Counting Consciousness. I think the original title of the first one was GPT-2, Counting Consciousness, and the Curious Hacker. And it covers all kinds of interesting things. And we'll have a link to it on the episode page. And if you just want a very interesting set of reads, I encourage you to read it. I just, I've now read it twice. And I'm probably going to read it a third time because I'm sure I've missed some interesting things here. And let's go back to something we talked about briefly. Uh, and it's one of the, my interesting kind of thought experiments, which will kind of get us into some of the uh, ideas from your part one, uh, which is deep fakes. I remember being very worried about deep fakes about two years ago. In fact, I actually gave some money to a little startup not-for-profit whose main mission was to think about how to immunize humans against the dangers from deep fakes. And yet, so far as I know, there actually hasn't been any serious damage from deep fakes. Somehow, the biological blockchain, as you called it, or our you know human ability to collectively filter out shit has so far protected us from any really grievous harm from blockchain as far as I know. I agree that I think that the amount of damage done by deepfakes so far has been relatively small, but I don't think that it's because the blockchain has been robust. I talked about this in the second part of the essay, if I remember. By the way, I just like to flag for any readers. I apologize for those essays being strange. <laughs> this was some of my first attempts at writing like long form. Hey, comedy. hey, now, now, the fact that they're strange is what makes them interesting. <laughs> Don't apologize. This, this is really interesting. You All follow right. a first class brain where it takes itself. So read the essays, even if they are a little strange. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. I do appreciate it. But yeah, so the second essay, I talk about the truly stupendous uncreativity of evil people. (laughs) I know like Bruce Schneier also talks about this, like the concept of like ordinary paranoia versus the security mindset. He gives this funny example. So when he was a kid, he had like a, like an ant farm and he has a little card in there where you could say, you could like uh, send an address, like a letter with an address to this, to this location. And they'd send you a bunch of ants. And an ordinary person would think, well, cool. I can get some ants from my ant farm. Someone with a security mindset would think, huh, I can send ants to anyone I want. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. And, yeah, and that's and it, it is kind of like a specific kind of style of thinking. Uh, Bruce Schneier is like one of the best writers on this topic. Eliezer has also written an essay about this. I forgot what it was called, unfortunately. And it's kind of this thinking that I, I talked about this in like the second essay of how if you are just like a little bit creative, like I am by far not the best security mindset genius hacker or anything like that, but just with that, like a little bit of creativity, I could come up with some really, really dangerous possible attacks that like I could pull off for like $100,000 and, you know, might would like ruin a politician's career or something like with like high probability. And I could like do that for $100,000 in my bedroom, but somehow no one has done that. And that's kind of like what I wrestle with one of the essays. Like, why has no one done these things? Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I participated in, I can tell you now, I can't tell you what the results were, with a exercise for one of the three-letter agencies where the hypothesis was you have a million dollars to do the maximum harm and scared the shit out of these people. I will say that my contribution scared them amongst the worst. But it's it's very, very interesting that so seemingly the bad guys are not nearly as clever as you would think. Yeah, and that's actually a big reason of why I take AI risks so seriously. Because AI, even if it's like not superhuman, let's say it's just like, you know, as smart as a smart human, it can still be functionally perfectly sociopathic. You can still create an AI that was so perfectly, consistently lies, manipulates, you know, controls. It can run, you know, extremely complicated networks of lies and sock puppets to such a degree that it will never slip up even once. And this is not something that we are prepared to deal with. Even now, like from my experience is that like one sociopath in your company can bring down the entire company. It's like- I've seen it. I've seen it happen. Yeah, Yeah, me too. It's very bad. 
Yeah, sociopathy. In, in our Game B worlds, one of the big flags we have is that uh, we have to get better at identifying sociopaths and keep them away from levers of power. You know, as someone who worked in corporate America, I have been known to say that to my good faith estimates, 10% of C-level executives in major corporations in America are sociopaths, which is a scary fucking number, considering that the number in the general population is on the order of 1%. Uh, if you go to finance, it might be 30%. Ah, not good. Let's get back to the idea of the biological blockchain as a sort of a starting point uh, for sort of where we were before we had other methods of building trust. Yeah. So the idea, um, I, I'm not sure if I still think that's the best name for it or not, but basically the idea is, is that in an ancestral environment, if you want it to build trust, say there is an idea and you can't evaluate this idea, you know, you're not sure if it's good or it's bad. And if you then see many people around you that you trust, you know, from your tribe, your elders, your family, your friends, and they all say this idea is really good, that's pretty good evidence that it probably is true. Because anyone who tried to convince these people had to, you know, it had to convince them that takes effort. And if it's a bad idea, you hope it takes more effort to convince lots of people. You know, this had that saying that, you know, you can't fool all the people all the time, but there's some people you can fool all the time or whatever. So in a sense, you have this kind of like trust mechanism is that seeing lots of people that you trust endorsing an idea can kind of like alleviate your desire necessarily to check the idea yourself, or it might even be an idea that you yourself can't validate. So this is kind of like a, our truth making mechanism, like our, one of our basic ways of making truth. And the problem is, is that this mechanism evolved in a environment where there weren't text spots and deep fakes and, uh, you know, organized propaganda campaigns pushing anti-vax or whatever. Or Facebook algorithms optimized on sucking you in, right? Exactly. Like, I could definitely imagine that there could be a species that, you know, like if we just froze like technology right where it is now and like a million years past, we might well evolve some kind of psychological mechanisms to like very helpfully and, you know, productively deal with these kind of things. We might have very different cultural, social and biological norms of how to deal with trust and, you know, epistemology. But the fact is just we were not evolved for the situations we're in. And so we shouldn't expect these systems to scale it. And honestly, it's a surprise they got as far as they did. Interesting. So you then, you know, talk about security mindsets and, you know, the fact that uh, there's all, all kinds of potentials for harm out there. But then the one thing I found most interesting and caused me to think a whole lot is what might we do as humans? You know, we can't evolve very fast biologically. And I will push back a little bit on the million years. Uh, cause let's say, for instance, when newspapers and advertising first became a thing in the in the United States it was wasn't until you know 1850s when they could start doing fancy graphics in in newspapers relatively inexpensively uh, famously there was all kinds of s literal snake oil salesmen selling all kinds of uh, dubious drugs with you know claims it'll cure every disease etc and yet if someone were to put a snake oil ad on Facebook today relatively few people would fall for it if you literally took the same text from you know 1855 and and put it up though some would that's the amazing thing and we do have flat earthers etc and and such but uh, we have have developed kind of group and individual sense making capabilities to filter out shit, right? You know, the other one, other example I gave for a deep fake. Suppose you had a deep fake of Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton telling racist jokes or something. People would just like, just seems highly improbable, right? And again, there would be 10 or 15% would go, oh, yeah, them evil motherfuckers. But, you know, most people, it's like, yeah, common sense seems highly unlikely, it's particularly if the, even if they did it, they certainly wouldn't make a video of themselves doing it, right? And so we do develop tools over time to make ourselves immune to the worst abuses. But you then suggest some stronger ways that we can replace the biological blockchain. So why don't you riff on that for a bit? Yeah, so I, I would not consider this to be like a full solution to anything, but I feel like it's like such an obvious thing. It's also not unique to me. Like I'm not the first one to come up with this idea, obviously, but these ideas of using cryptography to replace some of our more informal methods by like more formally powerful methods of verifying information. At some point, you have to trust people. Bruce Schneier has wonderful essays about this, about like how there's no such thing as trustless technology that does not exist. At some point, you always have to trust the computer code or the algorithm or whatever. You know, there's always, and you have to trust the people who made the program. You have to trust the people who built your iPhone. You have, there's always trust. You can never verify anything. In a way, trust is the most powerful uh, skill that humans develop. The fact that we 
that we do trust other people is what allows our civilization to exist. For example, chimpanzees don't trust each other usually. I mean, that's actually nowadays considered like not 100% true, but just to, you know, you know, take, take the, the stereotype. Stereotype is- what's, the, what's, cl- what's clear about chimpanzees is they absolutely do not trust any chimp that's not from their band. Yes, that is exactly. Chimps have a very complicated hierarchy of relationships within their band. But unlike humans, all they can do is kill anyone that's not from their band. While humans have developed the superpower of long-range cooperation with people that they don't even know. Exactly. Like all the technology I'm currently using, you know, I I can't verify what this technology is or how it works. I've never met Jim in person. He's not part of my tribe. Like how how did I know that I should trust this email that appeared in my inbox that I should click on this link and then go talk to this guy? Like how, how do I know? And so... Trust is everywhere in our society, and it is a fundamental social technology. It is a fundamental tool and social technology that we need to, for a complex society to function. Cryptography is not a solution to privacy. It doesn't you know, make it necessarily. It's just a tool to allow us to do certain very powerful forms of privacy-enhancing technologies. The obvious ones, you know, like encrypting your chat messages or whatever. What, I, I, what I'm even more interested in and what I talk about in an essay is this concept of a web of trust and using public key for cryptography to verify and like sign messages. So one of the things you can do with what's called public key cryptography is that you can have a, a secret number, a, a key. And no, you're not allowed to show anyone else's key. And using this key, you can create like a signature on messages that 100% guarantees you and only you wrote this message and the message was not tampered with. So what I think what should happen is, is that this kind of technology should exist everywhere. Every tweet you send, every text message you send, every you know, every video you make should be signed, time-stamped, you know, identity stamped. Of course, there could still be lawless places on the internet where this is not enforced or something. But I find it surprising that I can just you know go on the internet and they'll just you know look at a tweet and I have no guarantee you know who this came from or you know what entity wrote this or and, and like who endorses it. So the way I think trust, so this is kind of like a formalization of the weak concept that the um, biological blockchain was trying to implement. This idea that I could explicitly endorse people. I could say like, okay, I trust this government organization, but not this one. I trust this newspaper, but not this one. I trust my best friend, but I don't really trust my other friend because he's kind of an idiot. And then I can see who endorses what, like who says this is true or who has comments on what. And then I can verify that in an unfakeable way. So if I see thousands of people, you know, endorsing a claim, I can check are these signed endorsements? Where does the signature come from? Who endorses these people? Like, is there a root node? Like, for example, you might have like a government that endorses like, you know, a special citizen keys that can be used for voting or, or, for, or for comment giving. Like, for example, there was a great, uh, like the FTC of like a few years ago uh, had a hearing, an open hearing about net neutrality. And it turned out that like the telecommunications companies hired uh, grassroots as a service companies, which is a real thing, which is legal, by the way, Somehow this is legal that then created thousands and thousands of fake users and fake comments in order to like push them towards one's possible policy. And in a way you think about it, it's kind of crazy is that you're allowing people to anonymously basically quote unquote submit things in the voice of American citizens without checking. This wasn't necessarily when the biological blockchain was still in full force. Back in the day when town hall meeting was called, you had to physically appear in the town hall to physically tell people what your opinion was. That verified your identity. And online, that's not necessarily the case. And this kind of, these, these keys could, and these like endorsements by different, you know, root trust sources could be a way of uh, allowing this kind of authentication to happen online. Yep. That's uh, very interesting. Just a little note, the grassroots as a service actually definitely exists. I actually hired one once when I was at CEO of Network Solutions and we were involved in the setting up of ICANN and there was a public notice thing with the Department of Commerce. Uh, I think it was $15,000. We were able to get 100 endorsements of our position. Now, these weren't bogus. These were from people who were small ISP operators mostly, but they would have not naturally formed this association to lobby on our behalf if it hadn't been for this grassroots as, as a service. We had no idea how to do it, but it, was, it wasn't it was entirely bogus, but it was, uh, I would call it AstroTurf basically anyway. And it worked. Well, not that it really made much difference, but yeah, such things really do uh, work. Now, it is interesting. Public key crypto is an amazing technology. 
However, it has one huge problem, and I, uh, I'm pretty familiar with this. At one point, I was president of VeriSign's uh, digital certificate business. And I uh, said, so we were always thinking about interesting ways to monetize public key crypto. And of course, uh, crypto coinage, Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, has brought this to a massive scale. And it all keeps coming down to the same goddamn problem, which is the critical fragility of the private key, right? Which is that to use your private key, you have to have access to it. So if you want to sign something, you need your private key. But to move your private key into a place where you can sign it, you've just moved it into a place where someone can steal it because of our computer technology is so bad. In fact, for my uh, number one Ethereum wallet, I, I follow the uh, thing that I keep my private key on paper. I don't have it online anywhere, right? And uh, which, of course, makes it really difficult to actually do a transaction. I got to do it on one computer that's offline. And then I, you know, on and on. I mean, it's really, really, really hard to actually use RSA style private keys. Yeah, absolutely. Sec securely. Yeah, absolutely. And my answer to that is that, yes, that is completely the case. I am fully aware of like how politically unviable this solution would be, like how complicated it would be to actually implement such a system. Our, you know, our, our institutions do not have the kind of, you know, just like executive capacity to be able of organizing something like this in any feasible time frame, I think. But my argument is that I think that the difficulty does not come from private keys themselves. I think it's more fundamental than that. It's just authentication is hard. It's just, it is hard. Authentication is a fundamentally irreducibly hard problem. The same way that, you know, People complain about proof of work with Bitcoin and whatever. And yeah, sure, I understand that it is a huge waste of energy and whatever. It has like all these back doors, but it is an irreducibly hard problem. You can't just have Bitcoin without proof of work. You can have like proof of stake, but it has other problems and other trade offs. It is an irreducibly hard problem. Trust has to be hard because if it was easy, it also makes it easy to break. It has to be, there has to be one step somewhere that is hard. That's just how it works. Yeah, though I liked your essay and that you laid out the fact that uh, trust could be on a continuum. You know, for instance, you could have an online platform that did not require a high trust certification. You, know, you could have the 4chan equivalent, which you mentioned that you were a 4chan -er at one point, right? While on the other hand, Facebook might require a certification from a government authority before they would accept your thing. And I kind of I kind of like that, you know, the, the opportunity for a pluralistic domain of trust that people could, could choose which ecosystems had what levels of trust and uh, you could have webs of trust. And so there's a lot, a lot of things you could do with your architecture, which I did think was good, though I still go, goddamn private key problem, make this really hard to implement as a practical matter. Yeah, absolutely. Like in practice, you would have like the less secure keys, maybe and you keep those on your hard drive and those are linked to like your, your shitpost Twitter account or something. Like if you lose that's at the end of it and you have like your secret government issued key to keep on paper somewhere secret and you only bring it out when you're like voting on something or, or doing like something that's like requires very high levels of trust. I'm a big privacy advocate. I think that if anything, I find it sad there's less, you know, super anonymous places in the net, but I feel like there is benefits and downsides to having very anonymous places. And there's benefits and downsides to have very not anonymous places. And I think these should exist side by side. It shouldn't be everyone is authenticated everywhere. Neither should it be everyone is anonymous everywhere. I think it really depends on what the use case is. I like that. I think that's actually a very important principle. And you made it very nicely in your essays. So again, read your essays. Let's end up with the, uh, the last and kind of the most interesting, probably provocative thought you had, which was in part four, uh, where you actually get down to what are we talking about when we mention the phrase counting consciousness? You know, this is a key question that we're going to be confronting before long, and we better start thinking about it. So, you know, what does count as a consciousness and why? Exactly. So this is a question I've been you know, thinking about for a long time, and I still think about it all the time. And my thoughts have evolved since that essay, uh, but I think we, we don't have time to get into that right now. But it, there is this real question is that humans... We humans have like a natural idea of a person, an identity, a singular, you know, like we have citizens and they're discrete entities. We don't have, you know, continuous citizens. We don't have 0 0.7 people are in favor of this or something, at least outside of statistics. You know, there's there's nothing like that. And the thing is, I think that is an, not a fundament, that is not a fundamental property of the universe. It is a emergent phenomenon that happens to be the case. It happens to be a useful abstraction because humans tend to come in one human sized chunks and they're not easy to reproduce. But if we say had like a human brain scan and I could just control C, control V, 
that uh, brain scan lots and lots of times, do each of the copies get a vote on like, you know, are they citizens? Well, what rights do these things have? Do I, what responsibilities do I have towards these entities? And this is just one of like the many, many problems we get once we start breaking down these like comfortable assumptions that, that do hold for biological humans, but don't necessarily hold once we really start building virtual entities and such. And like one of the things I talk about in that essay is like, yeah, so at some point you have to count is that if you want to have a vote, you have to count. There has to be a unambiguous way of counting how many people are voting, how will their votes be tallied? That's just how voting works. And then I, the, on the more provocative side, I argue about, well, you know, maybe for not for all cases, counting humans is the right thing to be counting. You know, maybe there are situations where, you know, you want virtual entities to be voting or to be part of your community, or maybe, yeah, these, these things get really complicated very quickly. And I don't propose like solutions or like obvious, like things like that. It's more like a food for thought is that this will happen sooner or later. Sooner or later, we will have entities sharing the planet with us that I think have a very real claim to moral patienthood, very real claim to say, hey, I'm intelligent. I have goals and desires. I think I should, you know, get some of the things these humans get. At some point, such entities will exist. I think that is very likely, whether it's going to be, you know, human uploads or, you know, AGI systems in the future. And that's going to break a lot of the assumptions we use to run our society. And I really do think we need to take these these things very seriously. And we'll have to rethink a lot of the fundamental principles of how we run society. Well, that's great. And it's absolutely true. I mean, if we say someday there'll be AGIs, uh, you know, we have to come to some conclusion about where do they rank morally with humans? And the answer is not nearly as obvious as you might think. I'd recommend you read uh, Connor's essays. Well, thank you, Connor, for another wonderfully interesting conversation. I'm really glad to have you back on The Jim Rudd Show. Yeah, it was a blast. Production services and audio editing by Jared Jaynes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.